Welcome back as we begin week 10 of administrative law. Let's see what we have to take away from last time. Only final agency action is judicially reviewable unless the statute says otherwise. An intra-agency appeal process needn't be exhausted unless the statute says so or an agency rule says so and provides a stay. Pre-enforcement review of a final agency rule is available as an equitable remedy. It may be granted if the issue is fit for review without fact-finding and delay would cause hardship. Legal constraints on agency procedure derive from a hierarchy of sources. At each level, the stringency of those constraints depends on whether the agency action is classified as an adjudication or a rulemaking. Under the APA, every final agency action that is not a rulemaking is considered an adjudication. Constitutional due process can require an adjudicatory hearing. Constitutional due process does not require a hearing in a rulemaking. An agency that has rulemaking power may use it to narrow and focus the issues needing adjudication in an enforcement action. A right to an adjudicatory hearing before an agency may be foreclosed if the issues have been predetermined by statute or rule. Unlike the Congress, the President, and the courts, many administrative agencies possess both adjudicative and legislative powers. Call them quasi-powers, as the Supreme Court sometimes does, if it makes you more comfortable. When we are dealing with an agency that has both adjudicatory and rulemaking powers, what are the legal limitations on an agency's choice to use one rather than another in taking a certain action that aggrieves some party? That was the issue in the second of two cases decided in the 1940s. Although it was a pre-APA case, the second of them, called Chainery II, is still the leading case on the question of an agency's choice to exercise one or the other of these two types of power when both are at its disposal. The two chainery cases had to do with insiders, officers, directors, and controlling stockholders, who traded in company stock during a corporate reorganization supervised by the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission. There was nothing secret or fraudulent about the trades, but the ins insiders admitted that they traded in order to protect their interests in the new company that would emerge from the reorganization. The SEC ordered the insiders to divest themselves of these shares as a condition of approving the reorganization. In Chainery 1, the SEC had used its adjudicatory power to order divestment as a condition of approving the reorganization of the company. It justified this order by applying the judicial common law doctrine of fiduciary duty. The SEHC had not used its rulemaking power to give specific effect to its interpretation of fiduciary law. The Supreme Court set aside the order on the ground that the SEC was mistaken in its interpretation of fiduciary law and remanded to the agency. On remand, the SEC again ordered the insiders to divest. This time, the agency appealed to the general statutory standard of fair and equitable treatment to justify the order. Again, the SEC did not use the rulemaking power, which it indisputably possessed, to fill up the gap in the statute by laying down the rule that insiders are barred from trading in company stock, P. 
pending a reorganization. The case went up to the Supreme Court again in Chainery II. This time, the court affirmed the SEC order. In doing so, it rejected the insider's argument that the SEC had to use its rulemaking power before it could order divestiture. The choice made between proceeding by general rule or by individual ad hoc litigation is one that lies primarily in the informed discretion of the administrative agency. The court reasoned that the SEC might not be ready to commit itself to a rule and should have discretion to develop rules common law style on a case-by-case -case basis. That could not have been very welcome news to corporate directors, managers, and shareholders who would rather not have to guess what the SEC would do next. And what of the insiders in the Chainery saga? Was it fair to them? How could they have seen this coming? That such an action might have a retroactive effect is not necessarily fatal to its validity, the court wrote. Every case of first impression has a retroactive effect, whether the new principle is announced by a court or by an administrative agency. Courts do it, so why not agencies? Should courts do it? The English legal philosopher and reformer Jeremy Bentham thought that the common law method was an outrage. He called it dog law. When your dog does anything you want to break him of, you wait till he does it, and then beat him for it. This is the way you make laws for your dog, and this is the way the judges make law for you and me. Bentham went on. They won't tell a man beforehand what it is he should not do. They won't so much as allow us being told. They lie by till he has done something which they say he should not have done, and then they hang him for it. Bentham's view was soon to prevail in the realm of criminal law. But in private law and administrative law, not so much. Of course, a court has no legislative power at all. Realistically speaking, courts do announce principles in common law adjudication, but courts do not pretend to have a power simply to decide cases in advance of any case being properly before the court. And the ratio decidendi, the holding of a judicial decision, is said to be no wider than is necessary to decide the case before it. The rest is mere obiter dictum. Compare how diligently interpreters strive to give meaning to each word in a statute with how readily they dismiss verbiage in judicial opinions as dictum. Even within these constraints, the retroactive effect of common law style judicial lawmaking makes us uneasy. When an agency that has in its possession both adjudicatory and rulemaking powers and chooses to make law in common law fashion with retroactive effect, shouldn't we be even more uneasy? We will look more closely at this worry in our next installment.